In trying to figure out summer plans, like the best day for scarfing down snow cones by the pool, chance and probability can play a trickier role than we might expect. Beneath the surface, this kind of scenario actually involves multiple events, even if we're only interested in the outcome of just the one. Like, meteorologists use data about today's wind speeds, temperature, and air pressure to calculate the probability of rain in the future. Today's weather isn't what directly matters for planning a poolside mingle tomorrow, but the likely outcome of tomorrow's weather depends on what happened today. And it turns out when trying to predict the future and make decisions, dependence crops up everywhere. As we've seen in the last few episodes, we're often up against uncertainty in life, from weather to wine selection. But we can often use information about what we already know to calculate probabilities about what might happen in the future. I'm Jason Guglielmo, and this is Study Hall Real World College Math. We started our unit on probability by talking about how mathematicians define a probability as a way of describing chance using a number between 0 and 100%, and the three main types of probabilities. And last episode, we started talking about how the probability of something can change when we're interested in how likely more than one event is to happen. Specifically, we looked at the intuition behind calculating the probability of two different events both happening or either one happening. Now we'll introduce a vital concept for navigating situations like this with multiple events, which is whether or not two events depend on each other. Like, sometimes two outcomes have basically nothing to do with each other, like the probability of rain tomorrow and the color of the socks you wore today. In this case, we say the two events are independent. But other times, the outcomes of two events are intrinsically linked. In other words, they depend on each other or are dependent. If you think about it, lots of events depend on each other, like the weather two days in a row, or how likely you are to wear a parka if it snows. To see dependent and independent events in action and how they lead to different approaches for calculating probabilities, let's consider Angela, owner of the newly opened restaurant, Binomial. Angela wants to make sure things will move smoothly during busy dinner times, with the help of her 10 trusted staff who wait on the tables. See, at Binomial, Diners often order a glass of wine with their meal, and while most people simply pick something from the menu, one in every ten groups wants more details about the wines. Eight of the staff know their Merlots from their Malbecs, and can give detailed profiles on the wines and even suggest pairings for their customers' meals, but the other two aren't as well versed on wine and would struggle if customers wanted detailed advice. In those cases, the staff politely inform the table they'll swap with a colleague who's more familiar with wine to wait on them, which only takes a few minutes delay. But still, Angela is concerned that if this happens too often, it could slow down all the dinner operations. So Angela wants to know the probability that a random table wants to know more about the wine and needs to swap wait staff, creating a delay. If that probability is small, then the occasional wait won't slow everything down. To work this out, we need to pin down some information. First off, based on years of experience in keeping track of all the different tables, Angela knows the empirical probabilities a table wants detailed wine information, which is 1 in 10, or 10%. 10 From last episode, you might remember that of the three types of probability, empirical probability is the kind determined from a sample of observations about how often something happens in the real world. We also have the probability of a staff member not having wine knowledge, which is 2 in 10, or 20%. So we know how likely either of those events are to happen separately, but we want the probability of both of those things happening. This is where dependence and independence play a role and can change our calculations. Here, the key thing is, in Angela's restaurant at least, there's no connection between the customers and the staff member who waits on them. The probability of the table wanting more details on the wine or not is always the same regardless of who's serving them. And likewise, the probability of the wait staff knowing about wine or not is the same, no matter the kind of table they're serving. So the two events are independent. In this case, we can use what we learned last episode and the good old fundamental counting principle to find the probability of both the events happening. Remember, the fundamental counting principle says if there are two events, the total number of ways both events can happen is the number of ways the first event can happen multiplied by the number of ways the second event can happen. Now, in this case, the probabilities we have for each of our events actually tell us the proportion of the ways each event can happen out of all the possible outcomes for that event. So when we multiply them, the fundamental counting principle tells us we should get the number of ways both events can happen out of all the possible outcomes. So we'll end up with the number of ways a needy table can get a staff person without wine knowledge out of all the possible ways staff can be assigned. 
And if you're thinking that looks a lot like a probability, you're right. Which means the probability of two independent events both happening is simply the probability of the first event multiplied by the second. If that didn't quite click for you, a good way to see this is to draw a tree diagram. For Angela's restaurant, that means we multiply one tenth by two tenths to get two one hundredths or 2%. So customers will only be experiencing that delay 2% of the time. In this case, it was clear that our events were independent because a customer's likelihood to ask about wine and the staff serving them had nothing to do with each other. But independent probabilities can come up even when considering the same set of outcomes. For instance, every night the deep fat fryers need cleaning and the kitchen floors need sweeping and mopping. The staff agree it's especially tedious on Fridays when they want to get home or head out for the weekend, but someone's gotta do it. Angela wants to come up with a fair way to assign someone to each of these jobs on Fridays. She figures she'll assign someone randomly to each task by writing everyone's name on identical slips of paper, shuffling them about in her chef's hat, and pulling one out blindly. The first name she pulls out is assigned to the deep fryer. Then she puts all the names back in the hat, shuffles them again, and pulls out a second name, who gets assigned to the floors. Let's focus on a particular waiter, called Hendrik. This time we're dealing with a theoretical probability, because based on what we know about the situation, we know all the possible outcomes in the sample space and how likely they are. In this case, all the names go into the same hat the same way, and so have an equal 1 in 10 chance of being picked. That gives us Hendrik's probability of being assigned the friar on any given Friday. And after his name has been picked out and replaced back in the hat for the second draw, his chances of being assigned the floors is still 1 in 10 because we can make the same theoretical probability argument as before. Being picked or not being picked for the friar doesn't affect his or anyone else's chances of doing the floors. So the probability of someone being assigned to the first task and the probability of being assigned to the second task are still independent. They don't affect each other, even though the same people are involved in both events. But Hendrik realizes there's a flaw here. If the probabilities are independent, then someone could end up doing both jobs. Given our work from before and the fundamental counting principle, the probability of that happening is 10% multiplied by 10%, which is 1%. Pretty unlikely, but not much comfort to whoever might wind up cleaning both the fryers and floors on a Friday night. So he tells Angela the solution is to not replace the first name picked out of the hat before choosing the second. That way the same person can't be picked for both tasks. But now something crucial has changed. Let's consider Hendrik's fellow staff member, Melissa, and the probability she gets assigned floors on a Friday. First, consider if someone else, say Hendrik, gets picked to do the friar. In that case, Melissa is now only one of nine names going into the hat, so her chances of being picked to do the floors are one in nine, or about 11%. But if she herself had been picked to do the friar, her chances of being picked for the floors would instead be 0% since her name no longer gets replaced in the hat. By not replacing the names in the hat, they've introduced a dependence between the two events. The probability of the second event is dependent on the first one. So when we're calculating the probability of dependent events, we need to be a bit more careful and account for the extra information we need. For instance, the probability that Melissa will be the one sweeping floors on Friday would be the probability that someone else, like Hendrik, is picked for the friar, multiplied by the probability that Melissa is picked for sweeping given that someone else was assigned the first job. The term given that comes up all the time in probability, and we represent it with a straight line. We can think about this like a tree diagram for multiple events. In the restaurant, the first branch is whether Melissa gets assigned the fryer, and the second is whether she's assigned the floors. Notice that the probabilities on that second branch depend on the first two branches. We still multiply probabilities, but for dependent events, the probability itself changes depending on which branches of the tree we're exploring in our scenario. And following this process in general gives us a way of finding the probability of two events happening when one event depends on the other. So to sum up, the probability of someone else getting assigned to the friar and Melissa getting assigned floors is 10%. These probabilities with given that statements lie at the heart of dependence and independence and are called conditional probabilities. And with a bit of algebra and using our formulas from earlier, conditional probabilities help us explicitly define dependence and independence with math. First, let's rearrange our formula from earlier. If the events are independent, then the conditional probability for one event, given that some other thing happens, is just the probability of that one event. That second event doesn't matter if they're independent. But if the events do depend on each other, then the conditional probability will be different from the probability of just the single event. 
So mathematically, two events are dependent if the probability they both happen is not equal to the probability of one outcome multiplied by the other. That was a lot. You may need to rewatch that a few times in order to fully get it. Like your subjective probability that it's someone's birthday at the table opposite you, given that you saw a waitress heading towards them holding a cake with candles in it, is probably higher than just your general guess that it was someone's birthday at that table. The information given to you by spotting the cake changes how confident you are. So conditional probabilities are how we use our knowledge about how things affect each other to estimate how likely certain events are. And sure, it took us about 10 minutes to formally walk through all the calculations, but when you're well-versed in probabilities and chance in the real world, you can use these calculations to make decisions much more quickly. Of course, for making decisions and interpreting uncertain events, we often want to know what we ought to expect to happen, given all the possible random outcomes, not just probabilities of specific events. And that's precisely what we'll be taking a closer look at next time. Thanks for watching Study Hall Real World College Math, which is produced by Arizona State University and the Crash Course team at Complexly. If you like this video, give us a like and subscribe. You can learn more about ASU in the videos produced by Crash Course in the links in the description. See you next time.